Welcome to BTI, that's Bible Training Institute. We open the scriptures every week, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Study with us and learn how to know God as a close, intimate, and personal friend, and learn what is soon to come upon this world. O oh, Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the privilege of being able to come together as a church family to study your holy word. And Father, we have tremendous things to study for we are living in a tremendous time. But Lord, the greatest thing that we need is a relationship with Jesus that is close, that is intimate, and that is personal. For we shall not be saved in groups. We need a personal relationship with you. So please abide with us now, we pray and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It is a blessing to be able to study the Word of God. Amen. Are you ready to study? Let's take our Bibles and turn to Daniel, the first chapter. We have some grounds to cover this morning. And we have been looking at some very beautiful things on the Word of God. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 1. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. We're going to Daniel, the first chapter. And we want to notice. Now, Daniel first, the, the chapter 1 is very foundational to the entire book. If what happened in Daniel chapter 1 was not successful, there would have been no Daniel 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 or 12. What was one of the great events of Daniel the first chapter? Do you remember? Daniel chapter 1. Anybody remember what was one of those great events? They were tested. And the Bible tells us what they were tested on. It was the same test that came to Adam and Eve. The same first test that came to Jesus and the same test that will come to us if we're going to make it to be a part of the special teams that God's going to use to finish the work. Now, Daniel chapter 1. Remember what that test was? It was upon what point? The point of appetite. Daniel 1, we want to pick up now in verse 8 of Daniel, the first chapter. And let's read that together. What does the Bible say in Daniel 1 and verse 8? What does the Bible say? But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion. Now I want to ask you a question. It said he would not defile himself. He purposed this not outside, but he purposed this where? In his what? So the first thing that we see is that something happened in Daniel's what? Heart. He did not want to be defiled. What does defile mean? What does defile mean? Corrupted. In other words, he did not want to be made impure. He wanted to remain pure and uncorrupt. And so the Bible says he made a decision in his heart. Now, notice what the particular point was. It said that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. What did he know could defile him? What do you know that could defile him? The king's meat. Now, interesting enough, what king was this? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. What kingdom was he over? Babylon. Babylon. So the king's meat was talking about Babylon's. It was Babylon's diet. And it wasn't Babylon's worse. No, you know, Babylon, you know, you have degrees of food. The food you give this person, that person. But the king's portion meant that this was the food that was set aside, not for the peasant. But this was the food that was set aside for the king himself. Do you give the best of the food or the worst of the food to the king? So this food that was the Babylon's diet, this was Babylon's best, not his worst. It was Babylon's what? Best. But Daniel knew that the best thing that Babylon can give would defile him. And Daniel said, no, that's inferior. The, the diet that Babylon's going to give me, the, the, the greatest kingdom of the world at that time, the most sophisticated kingdom. You know that Babylon's uh, hanging gardens was part of the seven wonders of the world. Still today. They look at Babylon. Babylon had aqueducts. They had a plumbing system. I mean, they're looking and saying, how in the world Babylon that was over in Africa, Babylon was very highly civilized. And when they did this, it's amazing to me that Babylon's best, Daniel recognized, was not good enough for the child of God. Amen. Were they trying to do something bad to Daniel? Do you know that sometimes today America can offer you a diet? You know, America has a diet and it's called the sad diet. The what diet? Sad. You know what that stands for? The standard 
American diet. S standard, A American, D diet. So the standard American diet is a sad diet. We don't want that diet. And that diet came from Babylon. God is calling us out of Babylon. He's calling us into a better system. He's calling us into a higher system. He's calling us into a superior system. And we want to understand that God has a diet. And it's not a sad diet. God has a glad diet. A what diet? Glad, glad diet. One diet will make you sad. And the other diet will make you glad. You know what the glad diet is? The glad diet is God's life activating diet. God's what? Life activating diet. Diet. That even if you've been sick, there's a diet that can activate your life. That even if you're unhealthy and you've been uh, uh, brought down, God has a diet that can redeem us and restore us and lift us up. I want to understand this program. Now, we'll come back in another time and talk about these two different diets from the spiritual standpoint as well as the physical standpoint. That's not our study uh, this morning. But we see these two different diets. Now, Daniel. Did Daniel say to the king, oh, you wicked man, why would you give me this diet? I don't want it. I condemn you. Is that what Daniel said? No. That would never have reached Babylon. Daniel was a missionary inside of Babylon. And what Daniel was in Babylon, every seven day Adventist is to be to the world. And so Daniel did not go over. You know what Daniel did? Daniel was wise. And he had a spirit, a different type of spirit that was able to win those around him. Daniel said, when he was brought into tender favor, uh, let me drop this in, by the way, uh, just, just in passing. When the diet, when you start looking at things and studying their diet, you start recognizing them. For example, which one do you like better, wasp or bees? Wasp or bees? bees. I like bees better than wasp. Uh, um, on many counts, um, on many counts. I love bees. You like bees too, Brother Bill? Brother Bill and I, we love, we love bees. <laughs> now, on many counts, I love bees. But on one count, you know, the bee's diet is different than the wasp diet. Where the wasp will eat a, diet, a bee, will never eat. And see, the, the temperament of the bee is different than the wasp too. And his life, you know, the, if, if the bee is going to sting you, he always, he's only going to do it once. <laughs> he's not going to get you again and again and again. That's how the devil is. God, the bee, he'll only get you once. If he's going to get you just one time, if he gets you. But the diet of the bee is the diet, it's the glad, it's the glad diet. I promise you, it's the glad diet. Now, the diet of the wasp, I promise you, it's the same diet that America's on. I promise you, the same diet. They eat the same thing. And when you meet a man on that diet, he treats you just like the wasp does. <laughs> he will sting you how? Again and again and again. So it creates a different temperament. But now, uh, as we come back to that, Daniel didn't do that. Daniel had a different spirit because of his, uh, his relationship with God and the diet that God gave him. Now, he said, this is what I'm going to do. Remember what he said? Look down at uh, verse 9. Look down at verse 9. It says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with what? The prince, the prince of the eunuchs. And verse 10 says, and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who have appointed your what? Meat. And your, he said, look, I fear the king. He'll take my head off. He gave you his best, his diet, his drink. And so what did Daniel ask? Daniel said, I'm, I want to make a gentle request. What was Daniel's request? He said, I want you to test me for 10 days. How many days? 10 days. Now, it's very important. We don't have time to get into all of it right now because we're going somewhere. But on the Day of Atonement, that was the 10th day of the seventh month. On the first day was the Feast of T uh, Trumpets on the first day of the 10th month. And it blew in Israel to tell them to start preparing for the 10th day. And they had 10 days in which to get ready. Do you remember in the New Testament when Pentecost was getting ready to take place, Jesus had been on this earth for 40 days and he said Pentecost was coming. Pentecost came on what day? The 50th day. So if he had been there for 40 days and then left, how many days was there between Christ leaving and Pentecost? Ten. So how many days did they have to prepare in the upper room? You will notice that 10 is normally a number of preparation. And so you will begin to start finding out that there was a preparation that Daniel knew about that 10 days would allow to happen. And so he said to them, for 10 days, I want you to test me. Look at the continue going, going on in the verse uh, and going on to verse uh, 12. He says, prove thy servant. I beseech thee. How long? 
10 days and let them give us not a sad diet, but what? A glad diet. Give us pause to eat. We'll come back and study some more. And not Kool-Aid, not soda pop, not Sprite or 7-Up or Mountain Dew. You know, we up in the hills and mountains and mountain, not Mountain Dew. You know, oh, no. <laughs> what he told them was, he said, give them what? Water. Water to drink. And he said, test me for 10 days. Now I want to ask you a question. Was Daniel getting ready to start a diet he had never had before? No. no. So 10 days more of eating would not have changed Daniel. He would have stayed looking the same. So that 10 day test is Daniel understood what would happen that many of those that were on the same diet that he was on, that in 10 days, the king's diet would have an effect to bring others down while Daniel and his health remain optimal in the same. Amen. Now I want to ask you a question. If you doubt what I say, you can give God a 10-day trial. The diet that we're speaking of right now, give God 10 days. And you say, you know what? I don't care whatever. I'm going to stop. I don't care what my wife gives me, my husband gives me, my family gives me. For 10 days, I'm going to take not Babylon's diet. For 10 days, I'm going to take this. This was Daniel's challenge. For 10 days, I'm going to take this diet and see if it does something to my physical body and my spiritual soul. I challenge you. Now, if you can't take the challenge, guess what it indicates? Addiction. Addiction. And if we're addicted to a diet, something's wrong with the diet. Something's wrong. And so we have to, in our minds, say, dear God, I want to be a part of this team. Because, see, there is something that God is trying to accomplish. What's that doing there? <laughs> What's that doing there? What's that doing there? Anybody know what that is? <laughs> what's, what's this pill doing, Brother Tim? <laughs> is that pill? Do you want that pill? No. That's a sleeping pill. I want a red pill. That's going to wake me up. You want that pill? Yes. Now watch. Here's John on the Isle of Patmos, the artist's rendition of this. Keep the mind clear. Let's read this together. The Testimonies of Ministers 114, it says, We have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? The now, do we prove that from the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. Is that a gift from the priest? Yes or no? Yes. I was overjoyed as I heard uh, Sister Shirley speaking of the blessing of the Bible and of the testimony of Jesus. Amen. Priceless gems are to be found in the word of God. Those who search this word should do what? Keep the mind clear. What do we need to do with the mind? We need to keep it what? Clear. Never should they indulge. Not once in a while on Thanksgiving or Christmas. That's not what it says. It says what? Never should they indulge perverted appetite in eating or drinking. Remember our habits of eating and drinking. Do something. It says... If they do this, if they do what? If they indulge, pervert appetite in eating and drinking. If they do this, the brain will be what? That tells me there's a relationship between the brain and what else? The and the belly. The mind and the mouth. There's a relationship. If they do this, the brain will be confused. They will be unable. What does unable mean? They won't like to do it. Is that what it means? What does unable mean? They can't do it. No ability. It says they will be unable to bear the strain of digging deep to find out the meaning of those things which relate to the closing scenes of this earth's history. So if my mind is not clear, will I be able to understand what's happening in, these final, in this final generation? Yes or no? So it'd be no good even to study it if my mind is unclear. And so what God wants to do first, do you notice that before Daniel 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, 10, 11, 12, there came this test upon appetite, yes. this test upon health reform. Before Jesus did the rest of his public ministry, there came that first test upon appetite. If he failed there, there'll be no more need for his public ministry. No need for a cross if he failed there. When Adam failed, my brothers and sisters, everything else was lost. 
But the second Adam came to succeed where the first Adam fell. And our only hope of regaining Eden will be coming back to understand the truth on health reform. I want this. What do you say? Yes. It says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entire different what? Religious experience. Now, in Daniel chapter 1, you will notice at the end of the chapter, verse 20, notice what it says in verse 20. It says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them, what everybody? Ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were where? In all his realm. Now look at verse 17. As for these four children... God gave them what? Knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had what, everybody? Understanding how? When did God give him that understanding of dreams and visions? Before his test on appetite and health or after his test on appetite and health? Do you think it came, verse 16 came accidentally right there? Or do you think it was after he decided that I would eat? Pause and drink water. I will go back to the original diet in Eden. And I will go back to the original drinking of Eden. And the diet of heaven and the drinking of heaven. Then God says, now and I'm going to give you understanding of dreams and visions. Do you want to understand the visions of Daniel and Revelation? Yes. Do you want this entire different religious experience? Then we have to keep the mind. Clear. And we must accept the same diet and the same hell that Daniel accepted. Are you with me? Yes. So we're going to go further, further than that. Inspiration tells us. The neglect of the church to live up to the light which they have had upon what? Now, does anybody know when health reform came to the Seventh Adventist Church? Now, when did Christ go into the most holy place? 1844, October 22nd. Anybody know when the, uh, the year that health reform came to our people? Anybody know when health reform came to us? Do you know that when James White and Sister White and the other pioneers like, uh, like uh, uh, Hiram Metzen and the others, do you know that when they first came to, uh, into this church, uh, into the understanding of 1844, do you know that most of them were eating pork and lard and all types of flesh? They were eating everything when they first came into this movement. But when they went into the most holy place, they recognized that there was a duty of the congregation on the Day of Atonement past the Sabbath and Sabbath reform. They begin to understand that it took in every duty of life, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. And you will find that although they started eating all of this, as the light of health reform began to shine, we'll find it came to us in 1863. On June 6, 1863, the great subject of health reform was opened up to our people and it was given clearly to the prophet in a vision in June 6, 1863. And guess what day it was? It was the Sabbath. You remember we studied last week? That the Sabbath and health. When did Jesus do more, most of his healings? What was happening? A tent meeting was going on in Oswego, Michigan. James White was very sick because of his diet and overworking. I mean, if you only have a few people and you've got to reach the world, well, Brother Jimmy, you got to work. <laughs> and if you have nobody giving you money, guess what you have to do? you got to work some more. <laughs> and so he was breaking down his health in the process. And God had many times when the prophet and other pioneers were sick, they had prayed over these men and they were raised up miraculously. They thought on that Friday of June 6, 1863, as the sun was setting, and they were at the house of A. Hillard, a man uh, 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 of, of great standing, leading out in a, a, a evangelistic work. They were praying for James White, who was very sick. And they thought that God was going to, guess what? Raise him up the same way he had been raising him up from 1844. Just the touch and boom, they came up. But God wasn't going to do it this time. He was going to do something better than simply giving us a miraculous healing. He said, I'm going to do something better than that. I'm going to give you the great subject of, guess what? And this is going to raise you up. Not so you go back down. This will raise you up and keep you up. Because think of it. If God were to raise us up and then we keep doing the same thing we're doing, what's going to happen to us? We'll go back down. He raises back up. What will happen to us? We'll go back down. God doesn't want that. 
And so God says, I want to keep you in the way forever. And so he opened up in vision. God shared with her the principles of the Bible on health reform. Never heard it from any human lip, but heard it through the testimony of Jesus. I say, praise God. What do you say? Amen. I saw a hand. Yes. Is this why the church was established? Was after that? Uh, you will find the church. Now, now, there's a relationship, sister. There is a relationship. But uh, the church came in position that we received our name, Seven at Venice, and organized into a uh, to conference in 1863 of May. The next month. Health reform came. And the reason why you'll find God wanted health reform to be connected with his body, not independent movements. You'll find that today that many times the health is separated from the church and from the body and doing the work. But God purposely waited until his church was organized into a body and then gave health reform uh, for that very reason. Uh, so, yes, there's a relationship, but it came after for that very reason so that we'll understand. Because later on, when we study the omega of apostasy, all this is going to come back to haunt us or really to help us. But, but, but it's, going to come, it's, going to come, it's going to come back to us. All right. So in May of 1863, so June, but June 6, 1863, I remember we were doing a meeting. I forget what year it was, but we were doing the meeting. Someone asked us to do a meeting on medical missionary work and health reform and we were there doing a meeting it was a medical missionary uh, and their institution and the, we were there at a retreat doing a meeting called health reform and the 30 news message and i was speaking of june 6 1863 and the people said to me and i said yes it came june 6 1863 and the people said oh, no. i said yes it came june 6 1863 and then I, I didn't guess what i realized Today. that day was june 6 but it went 1863. He was, it was, I, I wasn't alive then. You, you would have said that. If I was alive in 1863, that was some health reform. You know? <laughs> it was amazing. We, we, were at, we were at the dinner office. I say this, we were at the dinner office and there was a woman there and she ended up starting talking to my wife and us and she looked older and she said, oh man, and she found out that Amaya was our daughter and she was talking to mommy and she was said, Boy, you look like a young child. You're like a teenager. You know, you're like a teenager having a child. And, and, my, and my wife said to her, you look like you're young, too. You know, you know, younger. And she said, oh, but, you know, I'll be, you'll be surprised. You know, how old I am. She was talking to mommy like a little girl. You know, you'll be surprised how old I am. And, you know, <laughs> but you are a very little girl. Now, in my mind, Elder Smoke, you know what I said in my mind? I said, I believe my wife is older than her. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think she understands. <laughs> So after a while, my wife didn't push the issue. And then the woman said, ah, so, so, how, 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 so she, my wife said, you look good. You look good. So then she said, you know how old I am? And she said her age. And uh, sure enough, she was way younger than her. <laughs> and then my wife didn't say anything. So, so then she pressed, so how old are you? <laughs> and when my wife said so, she said, what? Are you for real? You know, she and then she began to start acting like a little child because my wife could have treated her as a daughter. <laughs> See, this happens everywhere we go. We go to the airports and different ones. And the person, oh, you're so young. And then they look at the age and say, wait a minute. You're older than I am. But you don't look like it. Because God has a plan. See, sometimes you may think you look like teenagers, but that's not always the age. <laughs> now, it says... The neglect of the church to live up to the light which they have had upon health reform is a discouragement to the physicians and to the friends of the Institute. More on that later. Let's read this right now. Let's read this together. What does it say? If the church would manifest a greater interest where? In the reform. Now, I want to, I want to let that sink in. If the church would manifest a greater interest in what? Now, by the reforms, what does it mean? It doesn't say the reform. That's not what it says. It says what? It says the what? What does that suggest? What does that suggest? There's more than one. Now, where do we get our reforms from? What? Well, yes, the Bible. <laughs> but, but where did they come from, though? They're the gifts of the priests. So we got them from the most holy place. All these reforms are nothing more than the new duties that open up when we go into the most holy place. They're the duties of the congregation. On the Day of Atonement. So these reforms that have come to us as a church, if we would have embraced the reforms or the gifts or the duty of the congregation on the Day of Atonement, it says that the church would manifest a greater interest in the reforms which God himself has what? 
Now, what is he? He brought it not as a lamb, but as a what? Priest. That God himself has brought to them. What are they for? What are the reforms for? So the reforms are designed to do what? Fit. What does fit mean? Get us ready. Qualify us. Prepare us. To ready us. So the reforms that God has given us to prepare us or to fit us for the final crisis and the coming of the Lord. What would happen if the church accepted them? Now watch now. I think this is very interesting because do you know what most people say? And you may have heard it said. If not, well, maybe you even thought it. I, hope, I don't think we would have, but here, not here. But guess what is possible? People have thought, well, if the church embraces these reforms, it will push the public away. The community will be pushed away because if we accept the reform and diet reform and dress reform and music reform and education reform and recreation reform and life reform, then people will think we're strict and people will say, all right, they're so strict. Uh, let's go away from them. But if we just lower the standard, compromise, then all the people come into the church. You think that's the case? Why would you come into a place in which you're practicing the same thing already? If what you're doing is the same as what the church is doing, why would you go to the church? I mean, here's a man that's growing tomatoes. And you're growing tomatoes. And you get the harvest of tomatoes and the, your harvest looks just like here. Same color, same size, same look. And he says, well, listen, I look at your tomatoes and I want to show you a better way of raising tomatoes. What would you say to him? Uh, it's all right. And he says, look, my, my tomatoes are labor intensive. You've got to bake your, break your back to get them like mine. But you say, I'm not baking, breaking my back and mine looks just like yours. Yeah. That would not impress you to want to make a change. But now, if your tomatoes look like cherry tomatoes, but they're supposed to be beefsteak, <laughs> you say something, something's what? Something's wrong. It's supposed to be the slicing tomato for the, ham, you know, for the hamburger sandwich, you know, big slicing tomato, and you slice it up and it looks like a cherry tomato. It can't even fit half of the bread. So now, if that's what your tomato looks like, and that other man's tomatoes look like it's the size of your head, then you say, well, you know what? I might mind. I might listen to you. I might want to join your class. This is what has to happen to the Seventh Adventist Church. There has to be a difference in our marriages, in our home. Right. There has to be a difference in the raising of our children. There has to be a difference in our health. Yeah. There has to be a difference in our mind, our education, our recreation, the way we use our time, our money, our life. And when someone can see a change in our life and it's better, superior, then when a person looks at us and we tell them that we have advanced truth, they say, I want to hear what you say. Mm -hmm. But if there's no difference, no radical change, then we might as well close the doors because nobody's coming. It says, if the church would manifest a greater interest in the reforms. not which man, not Pharisees had man-made reforms, but the reforms which God himself has brought to them to fit them for his coming, their influence would be what everybody? Tenfold now what it is. What did Daniel's influence have? Tenfold more intelligent. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I want to ask you a question. That means that if a person was winning one soul, if one person could win one soul, tenfold great influence means one person would, would win how many souls? Do you know that that meant that our influence, if we would embrace the reforms, if every one of us in this room, every member of this church right here would embrace the reforms, this building would not be big enough to hold it. Thine house would be filled. Filled. And you know what we would need? Another church. And then if they embrace the reforms, you know what would happen? Filled. You know what we'll need? Until the gospel went to the entire world. Amen. Do you see? Yeah. So then if you were the devil, what would you do? Make them hate the reforms. Make them say, I'm not going to accept it. It's different. Of course it's different. That's what a reform is. If it's not different, then how would it change your life? It has been said that it is an insanity to want a different experience. But keep doing what? Same. The same thing. That's not intelligence. No. That's insanity. So my brothers and sisters, I remember we were flying an airplane one time. We went to one of the countries in the Middle East. And while we're traveling through the airports, mostly, most of the time, you can't eat anything, almost anything in the airport. We had to bring all of our food. One suitcase for clothing, one suitcase for food. <laughs> because you can barely eat anything that's there. Sometimes you have to fast and just drink water in the airport. But anyway, we we're going to a place. But as we went through the Middle East, interesting enough, the Middle East had more selections of food to eat from. <laughs> I remember that we used to have a friend that was, they were uh, Greek Orthodox. And the Greek Orthodox Church, when they get ready to go on what they call holy days, like uh, when it gets ready to come time for like, uh, uh, when they get ready to go through uh, just before 
Easter, when, they, when they celebrate Easter, just when they start going through Lent, they actually start purging themselves. And if you know the history of Mardi Gras, well, I don't want to get into that. Okay, okay. so the Prince way is they, as they start getting ready, preparing for uh, uh, purging uh, for Easter, and they're purging themselves, they change their diet. And they go on a special diet, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the diet they go on is the diet that we eat all the time. Or at least the diet of the most holy place, what we should be eating all the time. And I remember one time when they found out how we ate, they said, that's how we eat, when I, uh, 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 that's how we eat uh, when we're purging ourselves. And by the grace of God, we said, well, this is how we eat every day. <laughs> and they said, man, this is serious. Well, we were in the, in the Middle East and we're going through and I was going to a place, I, man, I'll tell you something. We stopped at this one restaurant and they had all the type of porks and other foods and this other restaurant was a Muslim restaurant. And you know, Muslim, they won't eat pork, they won't eat any of that foolishness. And then, they will even have a certain grade of, uh, of type of food. And then they had this other dish right here. And I said, and I went over there and said, what do you have? And he started telling me what he had. And he mentioned to me this plant-based diet. And he said, and I said, well, tell me about this meat. Because, see, I don't want to have anything that even uh, touches uh, this meat. And, I said, and he looked at me. He said, well, because of our, uh, our religion, he said, we have to make sure that when we're fasting, there's a certain type of fast in which there can be no connection. And so we make sure that none of this touch. That's one of our laws and as our Muslim faith. And I said, OK. So we talked some more and I began to ask him this. And he said, what do you want to eat? And I told him this and this and this. And then he said, are you a Muslim? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no. And then he said, huh. And he named us, I forget the name right now, but he named us a special type of an elite Muslim. You must be this. And I said, no. He said, the way you're eating, we only eat like this on our most holy days. I said, because of us living in the most holy place, we eat like this every day. He's listening. He said, well, what religion? If you're not Muslim, he said, I, I can't imagine what religion you are. You, you know that Muslims have very low uh, thought process of the Christian church. You know that, right? Yeah. And it's because of our practices that we're uh, if not embracing. I'll tell you another story another time. But anyway, so as we're there, then the Muslim says, well, you're not a Muslim. OK, uh, well, what are you? And I, and I was afraid to tell him seven Adventists. You know why? Not because I'm afraid of seven Adventists, but because sometimes of what we have manifested as who we are. He might say, oh, I use one of those and immediately thought. So I said, well, Lord, what can I say to him? And the Lord said to me, tell him uh, your biblical name. So I said, I'm a member of the Remnant Church. He said, Remnant? What is that? You know, I never heard that. <laughs> I said, you never heard of the Remnant? I said, let me explain. In Revelation chapter 12, because the Muslims know about the book of Revelation. So uh, 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 in fact, of all the Bible, they accept the prophetic portions of the Bible more than any other portion of the Bible. So Daniel and Revelation, big. And so they understood about, uh, about the book of Revelation. I said, well, in Revelation chapter 12, it speaks of my denomination, my church, my faith. And it says that that woman, I said, now, you know how the Muslim, you know the symbol of the Muslim, you know the, the main symbol they have? The crescent moon with a few of the stars. Not all of them, but a few of the stars beside it. I said, now, you know how your religion has a crescent moon and a few stars? I said, my religion stands on that moon that is a full moon with 12 stars. It must be superior. It is. <laughs> it is. It's the Bible religion. He was just amazed. Do you know that if we would manifest a greater interest in the reforms, it says their influence would be what? The man, when he heard that, he was almost ready to start bowing to him. I said, wait, 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 see that I do if it's not. You know? I'm saying, no, 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 no. But the influence that God would give to us, my brothers and my sisters, but that's just one. What would happen if we embraced every reform that came to us from the most holy place through the gifts of the priests? There would not be a building in Richlands that could house the people. But the reason why God can't bring so much into this church locally or worldwide is because sometimes we will not embrace the gift that comes to us from Jesus. I want to embrace the gifts. What do you say? Amen. Now, we don't have long to do this. It says how the generation cycle of history explains our what? 
And this is something that was written, re rewritten in June 20 and then 20, 20, 20, 21. How the generation cycle of history explains our current crisis. What do you mean? It says, as, the, as is the generation of leaves, so too of men. At one time the wind shakes the leaves to the ground, but then the flourishing woods gives birth and the season of spring comes into existence. So it is with the generations of men, which alternately come forth and do what? Pass away. This is Homer in the Iliad. Now, what he's explaining is the cycle of life. Leaves fall to the ground. We see them come back again. If you have been following, you know that Kate and I love history. We studied classical history in college. Kate actually taught American history and humanities in community college. And we're running these one, ones reading. He says, through our study of reading, something that we've been coming to appreciate about history is just how right the author of what Ecclesiastes was. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done. There is nothing new. What? He's saying if you study history, you will find that what the Bible says is true, that history is cyclic. Now, why is that significant? Because you will start recognizing in modern society, ancient and traditional cultures believe time was what? But in modern societies typically see history as... So modern history, secular history, modernly think history is like this. It just keeps one, at one point, you never see it ever again. So you don't know what's coming because it's, it's not going to repeat itself. That is the way modern history normally thought. But ancient history never thought this way. Biblical history never thinks this way. Biblical history teaches us that it repeats itself. That's the way life is, the one who made life. That's why we have four seasons. What are the four seasons? Talk to me. What are the four seasons? The four seasons are what? Spring. What else? Summer. What else? Fall, what else? Winter. And so this is the cycle of life. Jesus himself, we studied this, pointing to this. They said, the Old Testament is, is in many ways the story of a pride of cycle, which repeating periods of renewal, regression, and repentance. You go to the book of Judges, you'll see it. God delivers them. They fall into sin. They cry out for a judge. The, the God comes back, sends them deliverance. Then they, they are free for a little while. They go back into apostasy. They go back into captivity. And they hope hands again and again for over uh, hundreds of years. It says, uh, and many ancients couldn't help but notice that times of war and peace seemed to move in a what? So as people looked at history, they started seeing peace. Normally having the cycle, like for example, you'll see David, you go to the judges, you'll see they had peace for 40 years. Peace for 40 years. Peace for 40 years. David reigned 40 years. Next one reigned 40 years. Next one reigned 40 years. And you start seeing this cycle. It says that the ancients were on something with their cyclical view of time and after all. They, they, they understood something. Strauss and Howe. Anybody remember those names? Yes. Who are they? The authors. the authors of what? The four turn. Argue that the last five centuries of Anglo-American history can be explained by the existence of four generational archetypes that repeat sequentially. In other words, they say if you look at all of, for 500 years, not just America, but look at the Anglo-Saxon period, and you can look and everything is the same. You'll see these four seasons. Now, what are the four seasons? This book builds on the theory that history is cyclical, repeating it after four turns. Speaking of the fourth turning. Now, what are the cycles again? You remember spring, summer, fall, and winter. But there are names given to them. What's the first? The first turn is what? The high. So spring in the cycle of history will be considered the what? High. That's where everything springs up forth. Everything starts and regenerates. The second turning is what? Is an awakening. That's when people begin to start seeing Something needs to be done differently. You know, things are not happening the way they should. When people start getting back to reality after the high. In other words, you see everything look good. And then you start saying, wait a minute, everything's not as good as it seems. The third turning is a what? Right. So summer will be like the awakening, spring like the high. Fall will be like the what? Right. And you can think about that in nature. What starts happening in fall to the trees? What starts happening? Start Do all the leaves just immediately be gone? Yes or no? But that's when it starts. So that's when everything in nature begins to do what? Unravel. Unraveling, which people are unhappy with the way things were in the previous two turnings, are now becoming pessimistic about the future. And then finally, what happens? The fourth turning is a? a crisis. This has happened historically for a year, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we studied this, but I want to come to a point. Now, this happened from 1730 to where we are today. There has been four... Four turnings. 
When did the third, stir, third turning start in this last one that we're in right now? Anybody know what the year of the third turning started? We start talking about this. What would you say, my sister? Let's read this together. It says, they say the most recent, what's that word? Unraveling. What season? What season? Fall. Fall. Only one season left after that. It says, the recent unraveling in the U.S. began in the what? 1980s. So when did we reach the third turning in the what? Now, you better remember this because we're going to see that history is accurate. We're going to prove it from the Bible. We're going to prove it from history. We're going to prove it from science. Now, my brothers and sisters, then when should we see disease begin to start picking up in animals? 1980s. Interesting. When should we see the environment start unraveling? 1980s. And the environmental devastation picking up in the 1980s. Now, we studied coming events. I wonder if we found this out. So my brother says, well, we're going to see there's a reason. There is a biblical unraveling starting in the 19 what? 80s. Which brings us to a fourth turning or a crisis. We saw that if it comes in that time, that somewhere in the 2020s, we're going to see a crisis. This is what this history cycle has been put to us. This is an era of destruction, often involving war and revolution in which institutional life is destroyed and rebuilt. When did the Berlin Wall fall? In the 1980s, moving into the 90s. In 1989, the Berlin, win, Berlin Wall fell. It was unwhat raveling. Everything is happening. Now, our brothers and sisters, don't forget that because we're going to come back to that in the process of our study. Amen? But before we go deeper, we need to stop and pray and say, Dear God, as we go deeper into our study this morning, help us to understand. Would you reverently kneel with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we're living in a great Christ crisis time right now. You're trying to get us ready for what's about to take place on this earth. And it's going to necessitate us embracing Jesus and embracing all of the reforms that Jesus gives us as gifts from the most holy place because you love us. Help us, dear God, to accept these gifts that you may bring us back to sinless perfection, back into a relationship with you where we know you as a close and intimate and personal friend, and that we may have tenfold greater influence to reach the world that has no idea of what's about to take place. We pray that as we begin the study this morning that you remove us, for Lord, we can't understand this without you. Remove me, speak to me and through me, so that we may understand the word of God as we enter into this training session. Be with our minds, Lord, and may we embrace at once your teaching so that we can become just like thee. Give us power, Lord, for without you we can do nothing. Grant us your Holy Spirit, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, I want to turn to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want to notice what the Bible says in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. We're going to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I believe that it has become evident to us as BTI that we are living in the time of a gathering storm. Everything we've been proving, every field you turn into, we can see the handwriting on that wall. We can see that as the Bible tells us that things are not getting better and better as evolution teaches. We're not in an evolutionary process getting better and better. The things are not getting better and better. Things are getting, guess what? Worse and worse. America is collapsing. America is falling. The world is unraveling. And it's not going to get any better. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, someone said you're being pessimistic. No, I'm believing, being a believer in Bible and history. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read verse 1 together. What does the Bible say? This know also that in what days, everybody? In the last days, good times are coming. Now, if you believe the Bible, we don't look in the last days for good times. We look for what? Perilous times. There was a show that used to be called Good Times. But not good times right now. There's perilous times. Dangerous times. Now, the Bible says last days. Now, once we reach those perilous times of the last days, what's going to happen? Verse 13. Is it going to get better after that? Look at verse 13. The Bible says, but evil men and seducers shall wax better and better. I'm making sure you have the right translation. It said, evil men and seducers shall wax how? Worse 
and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So in the last days, once we get to that dangerous times, perilous times, is it going to get better and better or worse and worse? So my brothers and sisters, as we see America falling apart, it's not going to get better. It's unraveling because the Bible prophecy is getting ready to be fulfilled based on how we're living our lives. Now, my brothers and sisters, if America is falling apart right now, do you want to stay in a doomed society or do you want to come out of its systems of living? I want to come out. I want to make a final exodus out of his principles into the right principles that God has given us. So the Bible tells us that it's going to get worse and worse. We see it unraveling. We talked about this very unraveling state itself. Now, I want to ask you a question. Does that mean that something else is coming worse than what we see right now? Yes. See, if we understand the Bible, 2020 is not the end of the crisis. 2020 is only the beginning. 2021, worse. If God allowed 2022, worse. And it's only going to get worse and worse until the passing of a Sunday law. And then a time of trouble is going to start picking up such as never was. So my brothers and sisters, God knows that we're not ready for this. And God's goal is to get us ready. God doesn't want us to be unready. His goal is to prepare us. And so God in love and mercy and pity for the helpless human race has given us gifts from the most holy place that can fit us for this crisis time. See, something is coming to this country, to this continent, to this world, more serious and severe than anything that we've ever witnessed. And God says, I want to get you ready for this. So then the priest in the most holy place has given us gifts that can get us ready for this unraveling. Now, my brothers and sisters, we begin studying this. But what is the one of the most prominent gifts that the priest has given us to fit us for this great crisis? Talk to me, somebody. Health reform. Health reform. Are there other gifts? Yes or no? Yes. We talked about the law, the Sabbath, the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit. And there are many more gifts that that priest offers to give to us. Now, in fact, let's read this together. Hell for living, page 37, watch this gift of the prophet telling us something. Let's read this together. It says, you have what? Stumbled at the health reform. It appears to you to be a needless appendix to the truth. It is not so. It is what? A part of the truth. Its place is among those subjects which set forth the, give me another name for preparatory, fit. And if we would accept the reforms that are to fit us, tenfold greater influence. It says, its place, health reform, is among those subjects who had set forth the preparatory work to do what? Meet the events brought to view by message. what message? Because health reform is to prepare us for the events that the message of health reform uh, is connected with, tells us about. So in order to better understand health reform, we have to know the message that is designed to prepare us for. Does that make sense? Yes. It says, it, it's places among those subjects which set forth the preparatory work to meet the events brought to view by the message. Among them, it is what? Right. So among the preparation to meet the events brought to view by God's message, health reform is one of the most prominent. What does prominent mean? It stands higher than others. And so my brothers and sisters, we need to better understand what's the message. What's it connected with? What are the events? What are the program of coming events? What are these subjects? What is it talking about? The health reform I was shown is a part of the third. So what message is health reform de designed to help prepare us for? What event? The event that the third angel is prophesying or pointing us to. Does it make sense? Now we'll study that in a moment. It is a part of the third angel's message. And is just as closely connected with it as are the what? Arm and hand with the. So it says the body of this uh, symbolism is the message of the three angels. The arm and right hand is the health reform. What does the health reform do to the body? All right. I, I, I want to go through this door. I can't get into the door. Why not? What do I do? If the door is locked, what do I do to get into the door? I use my arm and hand to open it up. So health reform opens the door for us to do what the uh, work says. We will never reach the world until we embrace health reform. Never reach the community. 
Jesus would never reach the community unless he practiced the ministry of healing. And we're going to talk about that in another study itself. So we find that it is an entering wedge. It not only helps us physically, but it helps us in reaching others and reaching the world. And as we study it, we'll, we'll better understand. It is also the arm. If somebody's getting ready to hit you and hit you and hurt you, what do you do? You know, don't shake the hand. <laughs> but you get ready to hit me. I'm going to block it with my what? Arm. The arm is designed to protect the body. So if I can take away a man's arm, I can take away his what? Protection. So the reason why the devil wants to take health reform from us is because he wants to take away the protection from the church. He's making war with us. Now, has anybody ever known anything about the military? If you've ever been in war, you know it. That, think about Vietnam. I remember having a, a friend, good friend, uh, who was in the Vietnam in the military. And as he was there, he said, interesting thing, that there were two people that the enemy always shot at, more even than the regular soldiers. You know the two persons, the two types of people were? One was communication. And they, the way, back at that time, it's not like today, but back at that time, the one who had the communication, there was a big antenna he used to have to have on his back that struck straight up in the air in order to communicate with the generals and keep everybody in touch. Because you can't communicate in war, you, you're dead. You got to be able to communicate. So then guess what the enemy did? They, they didn't have to wonder who the communication person was. They said, wherever well, got the antenna, shoot him. Do you know that that's why the devil tries to take out the spirit of prophecy? Because it is part of heaven's communication. But this, that's the first gift he, as he wants to take out. But then the next person that they tried to shoot in the military, you know what it was? Amen. The medic. By taking out the medic, why do they want to take out the medic? He's the one that begins to help the soldier when he goes down. He protects, restores, and those were the two most shot at uh, in the military. Now, my brothers and sisters, then the devil will try to take out communication, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And then he will try to take out the medic health reform and medical missionary work so that there will be no protection for the body at large. This is exactly what the devil has done. It says, but the health reform is a part of the 30 news message and is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and hand with the human body. Let's read this together. I saw that we as a people, that is the whole church, must make an advance move in this great work. Ministers and people must act how? Not fighting each other, but in concert together. God's people are not prepared for the what? Loud cry, the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves, which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left this work for them to do. It is an individual work. One cannot do it for another. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Remember Daniel? He will not defile himself. He will not let himself get impure. It says, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness where in the fear of God go to Psalm 67 this becomes a good foundational text as we go further this morning go to Psalm 67 we see things getting worse and worse we see God wanting to get us ready this is why we've been studying the place of health reform in the plan of redemption the place of health reform in the everlasting gospel the place of health reform in the third angels message look at what the Bible says in Psalm 67 in Psalm 67, and notice what the Bible says. Is there any relationship between the plan of redemption, salvation, and health reform? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Psalm 67, many texts on that. I'm just going to touch this one as we go further. Psalm 67, in review. Psalm 67, and uh, Sister Minnie, if you'll read for us verse 1, beginning please. Psalm 67, verse 1. Do we need the mercy of God? Verse 2. So if God wanted his way to be known upon the earth, he must send something for his way to be known. Let's see what he's going to send. That thy way may be known upon the earth. Continue. So what does God want to send among all nations to make his way known, to open the door, to have an entering wedge? What does he want to make known so that his way can be made known? What does he want? Saving. Does health have a part? And bringing salvation, yes or no? Yes. It does. Or the Bible wouldn't have called it saving health. Now, we'll see its part. We need to know its place. And we need to know how it all fits together so that it works. It says, 
The health reform I was shown is a part of the third angel's message and as closely connected as the arm and the body. Now, that means then that there must be something about health reform that helps us to meet the events. You remember? Health reform, its place is among those subjects which set forth the preparatory work to meet the what? Yeah. So then what we have to do is to identify what are some of the events that the third angel tells us is going to take place. Because then we can see how health reform pays, plays a part in preparing us for that. Are you with me? Yes. Let's go back. Where would I find the three angels' messages in the Bible? Where would I find that? Revelation. Revelation. What chapter in Revelation? 14. Let's go there. Revelation 14. And you're going to find as we study more and more that if ever you separate any of our messages or reforms from the three angels, they lose their power. They lose their what? If you take the Sabbath and separate it from the three angels' messages, the Sabbath loses its power. This is why you can have a seven-day Baptist that will never be ready for the time of trouble unless he embraces the first, second, and third angels' message. This is why you can have a Pentecostal who believes in the seven-day Sabbath that will never be ready for the final crisis unless he embraces Jesus in the first, second, and third angels' message. So my brothers and sisters, what would happen if I would take health reform and separate it from the three angels' messages. What would happen? It, lose its power. it would lose its power. You know, just talking about health is not saving by itself. But when you connect health with redemption, with Jesus, with the plan, then you begin to start seeing the power come out of it. So we want to understand what does the health reform have to do with the third angels' message? You remember when we were studying the gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. We read in 1844 that the third angel was connected with the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy, was connected with the third angel from his very rise. And we begin to start studying, ah, so the gift of prophecy that came from the priest in the most holy place is connected with the third angel. Well, health reform was also connected with the third angel from his rise, but it took time to understand his connection. And so as we study, we're going to begin to study together to try to see if we can put together and understand its relationship. Now, we're not going to finish today. We'll understand it more fully when we deal with the ministry of healing inside of the duty of the congregation. But let's go to Revelation 14 and we'll lay at least a basic foundation this morning. Revelation 14. We're looking at the three angels message. Where would I find the first angel? Where would start me in the first angels message? Where would start me? Verse six. Verse six. Verse six. I love this text, so we'll all read it together. Revelation 14, verse 6. This is the symbol that Jesus gave to the three for the seven of his church. Verse 6, let's read it together. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the... Now, I want to ask you a question. So, what is contained in the three angels' messages? The everlasting gospel. What if somebody says, well, I don't want to hear the three angels' messages. I want to hear the gospel. Well, that man simply doesn't understand. <laughs> the three angels are revealing to us the everlasting gospel. So whatever I find in that message must be a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Bible says, the everlasting gospel, continue, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation. How many nations? So it's a worldwide message. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and it's a worldwide interdenominational message for everybody on this earth. It's not just for the seven Adventists. God gave it to us first to embrace it. But you know, this is a message that God designed for the entire world in order to know Jesus, yeah. in order to be prepared for the final events. And so we're trying to understand now, what about this third angel that the health reform is connected with? Where would I find the third angel? The first angel is in verse seven. He says, fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. He introduces the investigative judgment of October 22nd, 1844. The second angel in verse 8 speaks that Babylon is what, everybody? Fallen. And then in verse 9, we find what angel? The third angel. Let's read it there in verse 9 in plain language. Revelation 14, verse 9. Verse 9, uh, what does it say? And the third angel followed them. So this angel is connected directly with health reform. So verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, What did he say? Talk to me, somebody. If any man worship the beast and his image and his... 
Mark. mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall do what? Without mixture into the cup of his indignation. We'll stop there for a moment. That third angel warns against what? The beast. What else? The image of the beast or his image, which is the image of the, which is the image of the beast and receiving his what mark, which is the mark of what? So primarily the first part of the third angel is a warning first part against what the beast, the beast his image and the mark of the beast. This is the first part of the third angel. It has the last part though. And the first part is a warning against the beast, his image, and his mark. Now, by understanding this, it shows us events that will come under the third angel. What's going to come under the third angel? Amen. The beast received a deadly wound, but the deadly wound was healed. And under the third angel's message, the beast's deadly wound will be healed, and the image of the beast will then enforce the mark. mark. Of the beast. And if any man receives the mark of the beast, he receives the wrath of God, the seven last plagues, hellfire, and loss. Separated from God forever. So we begin to start seeing events brought to view. Largely, the great event is the mark of the beast. Brought to view by the image of the beast. We know that that means church and state is going to unite and they're going to pass what type of a law? What type of a law? A national Sunday law that's going to become worldwide. It will become an international uh, Sunday law. But it's going to start in America, and Revelation speaks of this. Now, do you want to worship the beast as images mark? Yes or no? no. You, are you sure? Yes. Because if you don't want to worship the beast and his image and his mark, that's going to put you in a very hard place. Right. Someone says, what do you mean? I thought that not worshiping the beast as image and mark is good. Well, it is good. It's a wonderful thing. But it's going to put you... Between a rock and the hard place. Now Christ is the rock, so that's all right. But it's going to be a rock and a hard place. Now, now let's find out what this is talking about. Take your Bible, take your Bible, and let's see, particularly in Revelation 13, what this is talking about. Now, if you receive the mark of the beast, you receive the wine of the wrath of God. Do you want that? No. Somebody says, no, I don't want that. I'm not going to get that. Well, then if you're not going to get that, guess what the world says to you? Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 11, this are, these are the events. We've got to see the events brought to view under the message to understand the place of health reform. Now, we're going to find out that health reform's place affects, under the third angel, two main type of events. How many type of events? Two, two main. We're going to find that the first type of event is a physical event. A what? Physical. The second type of event is a spiritual event. Clint, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, physical, and the spirit, spiritual, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we're going to find out the health reform does something on two different levels. It is to help us physically, and it is also to help us how? Spiritually. Are we together? So now my brothers and my sisters, then the events that the third angel brings, we need to find out what are the physical events and what are the spiritual events. Then we can see the place of health reform as it relates to the third angel message, as it says here, its place is among those subjects which set forth the preparatory work to meet or be prepared for the events brought to view by the message. So we want to see the events brought to view by the message from the Bible because we're in Bible Training Institute. So in Revelation 13, it speaks of the development of the beast, his image, and his mark. Revelation 13. You say you don't want the mar uh, wrath of God, and so you say you're not going to take the mark. Well, the world says something about that. The devil has a plan. In verse 11, or rather a plot. In verse 11, let's read that. Revelation 13, uh, Sister Nita. Would you read for us Revelation 13 and verse 11, please? Now, this beast, we studied in our class on coming events, and we found out it represents the United States of America. We don't have time to study that this morning. We'll come back and maybe in other lessons and study it again. But we see that. Now, let's jump down and see what is America going to do. Verse, 12 says, uh, verse 11 says he's going to speak as a dragon. How's he going to do that? Verse 12. Uh, little James, we read verse 12. 
all of the what? Power. Now we want to receive Christ that we may receive power. We were studying this this week. But it says, he exercised all of the power of what, everybody? Okay, little James, continue. So here's an event under the third message. That the beast and his image are going to do something to speak as a dragon to try to force the world to worship mm -hmm. Satan under the symbol of the beast. Now, let's go a little further. The Bible says, if you are not going to go along with that, they have a plan to get you to go along with it. Look at verse 16. Verse 16. Would you read that for us, Sister Davis? Verse 16. What does the Bible say in verse 16? Is that part of the message of the third angel? Yes or no? Oh, yes. This is a warning, which you're warned against. Now watch the event. Continue. A mark in their right hand and in their now what if you don't get the mark because you told me you don't want the mark because you don't want the wrath of God. You want to be his friend. Continue. And that no man What is one of the physical events that's going to come under the third angel's message if we do not receive the mark of the beast or worship the beast himself? We won't be able to what? Buy ourselves. No buy? No sell. No now that covers a host of things. Yes. Now I'm dealing particularly with the message of health reform that's most prominent. We'll come back and deal with this another time for other things. Because you're going to find out the devil's plan was to create a society whose system of living was based on buying and selling before he pulled the plug. Satan's plan was to develop a society whose system of living was based on buying and selling before he pulled the plug of the Sunday law. Now imagine if the devil had pulled the plug of the Sunday law in 1810, not much would have happened on this face. You know why? You know what's happened in 1810, how people were living? Almost everything they did, guess what? They did it by themselves with what they had. And if they didn't have it, they didn't use it. So the idea of no buy, no sell would have meant very little to those people until the devil did something historically. He brought something very historically. When you study history in light of coming events, it makes much sense. What did he do? What happened after the 1810 and 1817? Anybody know what happened in America and around the world? Something came in historically called something. It was a revolution. The Industrial Revolution changed society. It moved America. And you can look up an encyclopedia. I'm not making up this history. You can look in the encyclopedia. It moved America from an agrarian society to a industrial society who lived in the city, who used machines instead of learning to do things for them. You know, after the Industrial Revolution, after that started taking, after, after 1810, uh, when the Industrial Revolution, you'll start finding out that many people, if before the Industrial Revolution, when they went in hats, guess who, how they got hats on their head? They made them, guess how? By hand. In fact, Sister White's father uh, was a hat maker. He lived in the country. But because the Industrial Revolution came in around that same time, a little bit after 1810, the Industrial Revolution came in, it put him out of business. Why did the Industrial Revolution put the uh, 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 the small businessman out of business because, Matt, and let me explain quickly. I can't get too much on these things. Uh, but imagine quickly what happens. A man makes a hat. Takes him five hours to make that hat. Right. He uses the things that he has. How much is he going to have to charge for that hat? Oh, my money. His time. Mm -hmm. In making that hat. All of a sudden I get a, a machine. He makes that same hat. But he makes it not in five hours. He makes it in five minutes. Oh, yeah. Now, what can he do to the price of that hat? Make it low. So with the increase of supply, demand drops and price drops. Mm -hmm. And so now he can sell his hat that looks relatively the same for 80% less than the man who made it by hand. Mm -hmm. What will happen in a little while? That man goes out of business. This is literally what happened industrially. And so the people left the country and left their small businesses, came into the cities to start working in factories. 
And you start looking long enough, you start saying, wait a minute, that's what happened to me. Because you are part of history. In the industrialized society. Now, if you study the history of Richlands, you will find out what Richlands was known for. If you understand the coal mine and what happened there, but we can't go into that story. So, so, so in, the, in the process, stay with me, but, 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 talk to Brother Bill. He will tell you about the coal mines. But do you understand how this place, it, there, there, there are resources that, what, what, there's, there are reasons for this, but we, we, have to, we have to have another class where we can go deeper into some of these parts. But, and our point is, as a result of this happening, people begin to leave their way of society. Now, they begin to start learning how to work machines, but not learning how to live. And so now, a generation detached from making the hat, he now knows how to work the machine that makes the hat, but not the hat. Then he knows how to work the machine that works the machine that makes the hat, but not the hat. So what happens when the machine breaks down? Well, years ago, the machine breaks down. The man just takes that machine aside and he starts joining himself manually because he knows how to do it until he can fix the machine again. But when you no longer know how the thing works, you can't do it yourself. So you try to make another machine to fix the machine and another machine to fix the machine. But your problem is not solved. Do you understand? And if you go generations long enough, you have detached a, a generation who knows how to live to a generation who knows how to work a machine but does not know how to live. That generation is not ready for a crisis. That is the generation that we're in in 2021. Am I right or wrong? Right. You know I'm telling you the truth. Yes. You know I'm telling you the truth. You go to anyone in this generation that's a young gen person in this generation and you ask him how to build and how to plumb and how to do mechanical work and how to raise a garden. And how to make your own clothes. And how to do for yourself. And you know what he'll tell you? Why do I have to do that? I don't have to do that. I go to Google. Amazon. You know, before, before you went 100 years ago, you asked about Amazon. They wouldn't have told you a store. They would have told you a place in the, in, in the jungle somewhere. You ask the child Amazon, he'll say, that's where I get my life. That's where he gets his food. That's where he gets his clothes. That's where he gets his entertainment. That's where he gets everything he has. That his God has become Amazon. And when the crisis breaks, Amazon is not going to help you. You saw what happened on COVID. You know what Amazon did to you? <laughs> Amazon said, look, you better slow down. I'm, I, all I can do is ship masks. I can't, I can't ship you anything else you want. All I can ship is mask and hand sanitizer. But you can't eat hand sanitizer. Now, I know somebody suggested possibly, but, but it's not going to help you to eat hand sanitizer. Am I right or wrong? So my brothers and my sisters, this is an event that this crisis brings. So the devil said, I've got to bring society into a position where they do not know how to live except for through buying and, and then bring the Sunday law. Are we there? Okay. So now I want to ask you a question. We can talk about health reform. Now, later on, we'll, we'll, we'll build no buy, no sell to many things. But we're dealing particularly with health reform. And I want to ask you a question. Most of America today has high blood pressure, right or wrong? Right. Obesity. Yeah. Diabetes. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. Cancer. Mm -hmm. Breast, prostate, all the rest. Now, my brothers and sisters, we see sickness as a sickness. Now, I want to ask you a question. When the Sunday law passes, immediately your disease is going to disappear. Is that right? No, no sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. Now, what does the man do? He has arthritis. He has all these aches and pains. He goes to the store so he can buy. Give me a name for the. the they usually call them Bing Gay, but they don't get to call it anymore. There we go. <laughs> I see. What do we call it? What do you <laughs> I see. What is the thing called? Biofreeze, or, you know the names. So they go to the store and buy this and then rub them on the body and feel a, a little better for a little while. So I want to ask you a question. What happens when you can't buy it? All right, someone says, well, I have diabetes. But you know what? I'm taking metformin. So I'm, I'm all right. I'm taking the medication. You think that the government is going to supply you with metformin and you don't go along with the market of bees? No. 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 It's insulin. 
You, I mean, you go through it. Uh, you, 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 uh, the respirator, you, you know, COVID pop, pops up, disease pandemic, and you're saying, well, I just go there and get on the respirator. No, 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 no. You will get there and you will say, I need help. I got my card. I got, you know, I got my Medicaid card, my Medicaid card, all my health insurance and everything. They're going to say, sir, that's not enough cards. Do you have the mark of the beast? Now, they're not going to say it that way, but you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make a plan. Like somebody, somebody come back and say, oh, they're going to ask. No, 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 that's not what they're going to say. They're going to try and see if you're in harmony with the government and they're doing it right now you are beginning the process right now have you been vaccinated yes. now I'm not, I'm not asking you that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share with you that what's trying to happen right now am I saying vaccination is so evil that, that right now that's, that's not even my study right now what I'm trying to show you is now that if you say that you're against vaccination sometimes now the development is trying to be maybe you're not really with the government I'm going to show you something's getting ready to get much worse you can't have you come to school if you don't do this. You can't go to this job if you don't do this. You can't have this if you don't do this. You can't travel. And so somebody said to me one time, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to travel? I said, look, Revelation 14, that angel, he didn't need a plane ticket. He was flying in the midst of heaven. I'm not worried about that. By the grace of God, God has a way if we follow his plan. Now, I'm not by God's grace. I don't want to compromise on God's plan. I remember we were getting ready to go to Africa. Ebola, uh, the virus was picked up everywhere. Everybody had to get vaccinated, everything like that. And we were getting ready to go in Africa to do a meeting. And they said, you don't get vaccinated. You don't get because everybody, everybody who came in, no matter what, had to get the had to get the, uh, the needle in the vaccine. Our family went there. And as the people that we knew on the third message, do you know that there was someone who listened to the message who worked in the vaccination department in Africa? And said, I believe this message. And he turned his head <laughs> and he let us be able to sign a waiver form Amen. that allowed us to be going with no vaccination. Wow. And someone said, well, that was dangerous because you get sick. But see, that's only if you don't understand that God has health reform. God has a ministry of healing that can reverse disease, that can build up the immune system, that can strengthen us against all of these things. If provided, we understand God's plan. Now, Revelation 13. So the government is not going to give this to you. So what are you going to do when you cannot buy or sell? Do you understand? Yes. So my brethren and sisters, this is where this comes in. Watch this statement. Let's read this together. Helpful 11, 271. It says, as religious aggression. What is aggression? Hostility. Hostility. Anger. As religious anger subverts the... Liberties of now, now, you may not understand what's happening right now. I wish I, I didn't put the slide up uh, of, of what just came out in the paper. And I saw it on Fox News, you know. <laughs> but it, you know what it was saying? It was saying that this country today, under the government uh, right now, is one of the most liberal governments that have ever existed. Yes. And, you know, you, you, there's no question about that. You understand that. Everybody know that. Now, everything, all the rights for LGBTQ. Now, I know sometimes they have letters Z and X and everything. I mean, just do you have... Everything has been given in. Now, God loves everybody. Am I right or wrong? Yes. But God does have standards. That's right. So my brothers and my sisters, because of that rise in such a liberal government, the devil is using both to press both ends against the middle. And so now by first going to that uh, 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 subversive government, under the last four years or so, where it was pressing those to say, you can't come, you're from this country, you're from that, you're from this terrible place, you shouldn't come here, and this, all this, and then they, and they push people away, people start feeling that way, he's not being a loving, kind, liberal, he's not being this, and then all of a sudden, next uh, government comes in, and now everything's all right. <laughs> now, guess what people are saying, really, the evangelicals are standing up, you know what they're saying? Look at what this liberal government is doing, God's going to be upset at this. What is it developing? Religious aggression toward liberties. See, what people are trying to, what, what, are, what are the gay people, what are the, uh, the, the gay society, the lesbian society, the homosexual society, the transgender society, what are they pushing? What are they saying why we should get all these rights? Because of our liberties. You know, all this is under the, uh, uh, under the, uh, the, the uh, field in government and the field in the uh, constitution of civil liberty. As religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation. Does God give, them the free, does God give us the freedom of choice? Yes. Does God tell us to pass the seven day Sabbath law? No. So then God will give a person the right to break the seven day Sabbath. Yes, no. yes he will. Yes, he will. Yes. Now he doesn't say it's good. Choice. But he gives us all the freedom of choice. 
But once you see it being uh, perverted, many well-meaning people can't take it anymore. And they say, well, what, if these people are allowing homosexuality, allowing godlessness, allowing pornography and immorality and impurity and trade tra trafficking, we got to do something about it. And so they say, we need to undermine these liberties because people are taking these liberties too far. Are you understand what I'm telling you? So religious aggression subverts the liberty of our nations. That's happening right now. We're developing that like none other in 2021. Those who would what? Stand for freedom of conscience will be placed where? That's where we are. Because the son laws passed, we're not for the homosexual. We love the homosexual, but we're not for homosexuality. We're not for alcoholism. We're, but we're also not for religious aggression. So we're not between any one of those. We have no place to lay our head. It says we'll be placed in an unfavorable position between a rock and a hard place. For their... Now, there are many things you can do for God and you can do for everybody else, and we should do it. But it said for what? In other words, save yourself from this untoward generation. It said for your own sakes, they should... What's that next word? Now, you better listen to that word, Brother Tim. Every one of us. It says while they have what? Now, what does that suggest to us, Brother Smoking? Now, you know, everybody come here looking for you. <laughs> if you were blessed by this study and would like to be a part of the BTI, that's Bible Training Institute, simply have your Bible pen and paper handy and check out our weekly studies by logging on to molministry.com. Hover over sermons, then from the drop down, click the word video. Also, tune in every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the latest. Maranatha.